60,000 more people in the United States died of COVID-19 during 2021 than in the previous year. That's the latest figure released in an annual mortality report by the U.S. Center for Disease Control, or CDC, late April. According to the report, COVID-19 was associated with some 460,000 deaths in the United States in 2021, a 20% increase year on year. The report came as the overall deaths associated with COVID-19 in the country is nearing 1 million. The sad news begs many questions. Why did COVID-associated death toll rise further? Looking ahead, is the worst over yet? And how could these numbers inform policymakers in other parts of the world, such as China? Welcome to The Point with me, Liu Xin, an opinion show coming to you from Beijing. Joining me for the discussion today from Washington, D.C. is Dr. Eric Ding, epidemiologist and chief of COVID task force of the World Health Network. From Chicago, Dr. Wu Chong Yi, chair professor at Sun Yat-sen University. And from Beijing, Professor Hu Nai Jing of the School of Public Policy and management at the University of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Gentlemen, welcome to The Point. So, according to the Provisional Mortality Data Report, in 2021, COVID-19 was reported as the underlying cause or contributing cause in an estimated 460,000 deaths in the United States. That is a 20% jump than the same period of time for 2020. So, Professor Wu, let me go to you first. I mean, Professor Wu Chong Yi, the number of deaths directly attributed to COVID-19 rose by 60,000. What may have accounted for the spike? Well, I, I have been traveling in the U.S., so I think it's quite clear that U.S. cannot have a accurate account of cases, infections. I mean, it, it, unlike in China, you have this massive screening. You go to any restaurant, you go through airport, it's so congested. So I think it, it simply is just a number of infections, which is not the same as recorded as confirmed cases. The infection number is far higher than, uh, than reported, and it's not, very, it's not accurate at all. Dr. Ding, what is your take on the accuracy of the number and whether it reflects the real trend? Well, cases are harder to identify, but deaths and hospitalizations are generally pretty well tracked. And the better metric is not just confirmed COVID, but actually excess deaths. And we do know that the U.S. has over well over a million people in terms of excess deaths compared to 2015 to 2019. So the excess death is, is definitely not disputed. The, of course, um, although testing was less available in early 2020 during the first wave. Uh, it was pretty wet, readily available afterwards um, and in 2021 for sure. But I think the main issue is that although the vaccine rollouts started in December of 2020 and January 2021, most people in America, it wasn't widely available until April and May. And then, of course, there's vaccine uptake in the United States. It's not that high. It's only around um, 65, 70 percent um, in terms of fully vaccinated. And in terms of boosters, booster rollout has been pretty slow and uh, the uptake of boosters is still less than 50 percent. Uh, and now we have variants and the variants are driving a lot more mortality. And I think I also want to emphasize that in epidemiology, we know that if you have two viruses, one more lethal but less contagious, one 10 times less con uh, lethal but two to three times more contagious, which of the two viruses will kill more people? It's the more contagious, less lethal one. And so although vaccines reduce the lethality, the vaccine's efficacy against these variants for transmission is much poorer than they are against death. And again, runaway transmission infection as you're seeing in the United States, will ultimately lead to more deaths. So basically, when the number of people that are infected as a result of the more contagious mutant, which is the Omicron variant, then the number of deaths have uh, inevitably gone up. Uh, Professor Hu Naijun, is that your understanding of the situation as well? Well, generally speaking, I agree with Professor Wu and Dr. Ding. I heard from some experts several days ago that in the United States of America, some deaths are caused by other diseases. But if the 
the dead people has tested positive, then it, she or he will be included in the state statistics as uh, death uh, associated with COVID. So I think uh, there there may be some misunderstandings about this because in different countries, in different regions, even China, for example, there may be some difference in the statistics about the deaths associated with uh, COVID. So I think uh, if we want to have a basic understanding of the deaths, we must make sure that we have the same standard uh, across different countries and different regions that associated with the deaths mm -hmm. with COVID-19. Actually, or I, I think there may be some misunderstanding about this. Yes, actually, you, you raise a very good point, because when we looked at the report in details, it can be confusing exactly how many more deaths are contribute, are associated with uh, COVID-19. Basically, according to the report, the, the deaths that are associated with COVID-19 are divided into two categories. One is um, uh, COVID-19 being an underlying cause of the deaths. The other is COVID-19 being a contributed, contributive cause of COVID-19, basically saying one is directly caused by COVID-19, or you can say these people died of COVID-19, and the other is indirectly as a result of COVID-19. And there is actually- But, but those are still cause of death due yeah. to COVID. There, there's a- Okay, I Dr. Ding, Dr. Ding, yes. Because in terms of cause of death in the CDC data, there's, um, uh, UCD, underlying causes, and MCD, the multiple causes of death. And both of them are causes of death because, you know, COVID can cause, uh, you know, blood clotting that causes stroke, right? And and if, if COVID causes the blood clot and then causes the stroke, stroke is the UCD, but the COVID is still the part of the contributing factor. Actually, there, um, according to the latest CDC report, among uh, the, the 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 higher number of deaths that are that were associated with COVID-19, 90% can be categorized as directly uh, because of COVID, and that number is 60,000. That's why we said in the beginning of my leading that 60,000 people more died of COVID in 2021, um, whereas those who died as a indirect consequence of COVID-19 actually accounted for about 10%, and that's an addition 16,000. Um, but still, um, if we were talking about a second year of uh, COVID-19 um, spreading and uh, you know the, 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 the consequence, the severity of this virus was well uh, demonstrated during the second half of 2020, for instance, when th hundreds of thousands of people were already dying. So um, with the percentage of those, uh, you would imagine that people would know more about the disease, are better prepared mentally, physically, and are getting vaccinated, and yet the number of infections have gone up so considerably. Um, Dr. Ding, what actually prevented the infection numbers from going up dramatically, leading to a higher number of deaths? Well, obviously, um, masking is very important, but obviously, America does not want to mask. Uh, America is not using enough N95 masks, but then again, neither is China um, in terms of N95, KN95 masks, hmm. like the you know, used in Korea, the KF94s. Um, vaccination rates in America are very slow in some, some parts of the country. And it's so low that it's below 50%, some places below 40%. And, you know, you cannot get any kind of herd immunity with those kind of levels. And um, and people keep forgetting that in natural infection immunity also wanes. And so a lot of people felt that, oh, I'm now immune to COVID, but along comes a variant. And the new variants, again, are very evasive. Uh, and both vaccines wane, uh, hence you need boosters, and natural immunity wanes. Um, hence, you need vaccines uh, in addition. Um, but a lot of people became overconfident. They thought that, oh, COVID is COVID. If I had it once, I'm protected for life. And that kind of mentality really led people to be like complacent. And it led to, again, over um, infection in terms of number of infections that we could have prevented, but people felt overconfident. And it's just a combination of complacency and overconfidence about your vaccination, uh, rates and previous infection immunity that gives people this, um, we call it risk compensation, that when you feel you're invulnerable, um, that people then go out and party and gather even more 
than if they didn't feel they were invulnerable. Right. And this, again, transmission is the exponential driver of ultimately more hospitalizations and more cases, even if vaccines um, uh, reduce hospitalizations right. and deaths. Let's look, take a look at the, the trend of uh, vaccination rollout. Uh, the United States started to roll out vaccination since the beginning of last year. Um, and you can see that the first dose and the second dose picking up pace, the second dose especially uh, for the second half of 2021, uh, and the, the booster dose also picking up uh, during the second half of last year and uh, now kind of plateaued uh, at uh, around 40% of those who have received a second jab. So by now, we know that 66% of the U.S. population has received two jabs, meaning fully vaccinated, and uh, less than 50% of them, 46 to be exact, have gotten a booster shot. Um, Professor Wu Naijing, how do you look at these numbers? Were the vaccination rates too slow or reasonable uh, in terms of uh, the speed of its rollout and uh, f looking at the number of deaths as well? Well, I think in, in my opinion, uh, get vaccinated is only the beginning of the vaccination process. The real or substantial purpose of vaccination is to have antibody in your blood, which is, in my opinion, is a real factor to fighting against COVID virus. But I think right now, on the first hand, I, I've heard from some, some expert that the antibody may decrease after time. For example, they have some data on the publication that after six months, the antibody may be even 100% or even 10 percent of the original uh, uh, time of the vaccination. And on the second point is that uh, we don't know how many, you, you just mentioned that 66% of the total population have been vaccinated. Right. But right now, we do not have the data how much percentage of total population have antibody in their blood and what is the amount, what is the quality of the antibody right now. I think this is, in my opinion, the same situation in China. Uh, we get the two shots in the middle of 2021 last year. Mm. And a lot of people have the booster shot at the end of last year, 2021. That is to say, right now, we are in the middle of 2022. So I think a lot of people may have six months of the third uh, booster shot. Right. So I th I'm afraid we must take some serious calculating and statistics about antibody in the blood. That is, in, oh. in my opinion, more important than the percentage of people get vaccinated. That is only one step. But the most important step is to test the antibody in the blood. Mm, I see. Dr. Wu Chung Yi, what is your take on the effectiveness or the protection that vaccines have given to the US population? Um, still, from the statistics that we have, how much higher could the deaths have been without the vaccines? From the infection point of view, I think it's the number of people, number of infections. People who got very sick, are not very infectious. So you have you may have 100 people who are very sick. They may transmit it to another 50 people. But if you have a 10,000 people with very mild symptom, these are the people. So, so if we only look at the protection against infections, here is a data, very large data set from the Union of German Medicine. And I'm, I'm frankly, I'm a little bit puzzled why the media doesn't report on this. It's noticed before. If you think about people who uh, received the second dose or the booster shot 20 weeks ago, mm. so on every, I mean, people don't get, get the jab once every two months or something. You, 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 you got the shot. The protection is actually less than 50%. After 20 weeks, it's 38%. And I'm talking about, we, we focus only on the Pfizer, BMT. Right. The, the protection against infection is, is, is not very good. I think but but my question, yeah, but my question really is, even if the protection wanes as time goes by, uh, how much higher the death toll could have been without these protections, without these vaccines? From the population standpoint of view, 
if a lot of people are infected, even though the, 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 the hospitalization rate is low, you multiply the two number, you still overwhelm the, the hospitals. So, so I think it's important to look at the infections that we all agree. And this is the difference between the, the China social policy and US, that, that we want to reduce the number of infections. Right. But in, in the US, it's, it, I think the social cost is considered way too high and the liberty and so on, and, and even wearing masks is, is controversial. So, so the, if from this standpoint, the vaccination really doesn't protect against infection. Okay, Dr. Ding, what is your take? Because that's a very, very yes. important question here. I think that the issue is that, yes, runaway infection will drive more people to the hospital and therefore deaths. Um, and the infection protection is poor. Uh, with two doses, uh, you know, against Omicron, it's, it's a combination of waning plus Omicron, okay? So it's a combination of reasons. The, the issue is that the protection drops down to 30%. I've seen studies even showing 10% in terms, of, and that's against symptomatic. Asymptomatic infection, which is 50% of all infections, is even lower. We're talking about probably down next to zero. Um, um, with boosters, it goes up to 70%, but... Even with after 10 weeks with boosters, it wanes uh, in symptomatic infection protection, it wanes on 45%. But it's what's the like alternative? Closing. Right. What's the alternative? Yeah. Could you afford? The alternative, yeah. uh, it, the, the, there, there's basically two strategies. You either let it spread to the point that you keep hospitals relatively okay, or you stop the spread. And the, the U.S. has taken the, oh, we're going to let it spread as long as the hospitals are not full. But, you know, I always tell people, you know, this is not a very, this is a very morally dubious uh, position because it's not like you tell mm -hmm. people you can drink and drive as hospitals are, beds are, are, are not full. You, you don't have to buckle your seatbelts. Um, you don't wear, they need to wear helmets when bicycling if the hospital beds are not full. That's not public health in any way. And again, we know that, you know, keeping your hospital beds full is still not a good strategy because you're going to allow for runaway infection. And I just want to say with with two shots against BA2, the latest Omicron BA2 variant, the UK study says two shots only gives you 59% lower risk of mortality. That is really, really far off from the 95, 99% where we were originally told in 2020 against the old strain. But, but should so people still why. get vaccinated because you don't have a better yes, option? Yes, they definitely this get way. vaccinated because if you get boosted, you, you get your protection against hospitalization and death up to 95%. You, you definitely need to get vaccinated. Okay. But again, even that in itself is not enough because that 5% that slipped through, you multiply exponentially uh, with an exponential power, and then the, the runaway cases will ultimately always over swamp the hospitals and that's what's happening in, in the uk right now mm. and that's what's happening in many parts of uh, you know for example hong kong yeah. um and that's uh, and and we we know what will happen so it's a combination of keeping hospitals empty and stopping transmission okay. and the u.s has only done one part of it while china is, is focusing more on stopping the transmission Looking ahead, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who is the U.S. government's top infectious disease expert, said that hopefully we are getting to a phase of somewhat better control, but uh, that's not agreed to by everybody. For instance, Dr. Uh, Deborah Birx, another expert, said the U.S. should be prepared for another potential COVID-19 surge. Dr. Wu um, in the United States, what's your prediction? Is it predictable how the virus will mutate next? Well, certainly the uh, the virus will, will mutate. We we actually had the report that's coming out that there is a positive loops. In other words, that that if you have more infections, then the evolution will go faster. This is standard evolution theory, and when the evolution goes faster, the number of infection would increase. So there is a positive feedback. You have more infection, then the virus would infect. Uh, evolve faster. And the Will the faster, virus be less deadly? Uh, whether the virus is less or more deadly is, uh, is coincidental. People keep saying that if you become, if the virus become more infectious, you will become less virulent. No, they are uncorrelated. Uh, Dr. Ding, uh, what is your take on the, the next 
uh, possible prospect? Can the people in the United States, authorities in the United States say, okay, now, from now on, we have seen several uh, waves and uh, things is going to get better from now on because you do see the number of deaths going down. Can the United States start to really live with the virus from now on? Well, I think it's still very dangerous to you know, say live with the virus because the virus has, again, besides deaths and hospitalizations, a very high number of uh, long COVID, um, even potentially 10% of those who are even vaccinated uh, and 20, 30% of those who are unvaccinated. In terms of evolution, I want to say that you know, infectiousness is oftentimes also driven by viral load, which also drives severity. So there's, you're never going to get a completely uh, inert virus because if it's trying to evolve to be more infectious, one of the ways is viral load. And so that will always keep the severity to, uh, also higher to some degree. And we're already seeing, for example, uh, BA2 has a daughter variant that has completely um, become dominant. Um, and in South Africa, BA4 and BA5 and the new BA2121 are, have are been found to be not only more contagious than the original BA2, but also more evasive against the uh, previous BA1 infection. So if you were infected in December, January with the original BA1 Omicron, you are not fully protected against these new BA4, BA5, and BA2121 because it, they are so much more different. Yeah, Eric, basically what yeah, you're we're saying we're is- We're seeing this huge treadmill and the US is definitely gonna see a surge very, very soon. And we're already seeing the wastewater. The wastewater data does not lie. It's agnostic of testing. So the wastewater cases are definitely surging. Yep. So basically, in layman's term, basically you're saying whether you have caught COVID, whether you've survived COVID once or twice or three times, it doesn't necessarily prepare you for future infections? That's correct, because the future infections are a different virus strain. And as if we keep letting the transmission uh, treadmill keep going, we're going to run into more and more of these problems. But so stopping transmission ultimately is the critical key or inventing a vaccine that has um, sterilizing immunity that prevents the onset of infection in the first mm. place. But we are not even close to that vaccine yet. Let me stay with you for this because you are in the United States where the situation is uh, very interesting. Um, some people are saying, okay, if my past infections does not prepare me for any future or does not prevent me from catching it in the future, but my past infections didn't do anything significant to me in a, in a visible way, at least, or in a way that I can feel any different, then, okay, let me catch another one. Let me catch a third one. How about that? Well, I, I, I remind people that, first of all, people who died already, the, there's a saying, dead men tell no tales, right? And then, uh, so there's this survivor bias. And there's also a long COVID. There's a growing, growing body of long COVID survivors. And the more you get infected, the greater risk of having long COVID. It's kind of playing Russian roulette too many times. Eventually, you're going to have a greater onset. And UK studies also show that even if you're not hospitalized, even if you have mild to moderate symptoms, um, you actually lose IQ points. If you're hospitalized and intubated, you have lose a five to seven IQ point equivalent. But even if you're not hospitalized, if you had mild symptoms, you still lose from anywhere one to three IQ points. And to, for reference, lead poisoning in children lowers IQ points by two. And so we you don't become allow dumber, lead basically you're saying, you become dumber over the time. <sighs> this is one of those morbidities and long, long COVID is gonna become a long-term chronic disease that's gonna be inflicted by this virus. Okay. And I think that chronic disease is something that we will be paying a price for in many, many years to come. And we are just not ready for that. All right. Um, Professor Hu, what is your take on the same question? And uh, also help us understand, because China pursue a, pursues a dynamic zero COVID approach. Basically, we're going to try to stamp out the virus as fast, as early, as hard as possible, wherever and whenever it occurs. Does China, given all the discussion that we have, does China have another option? Because this current zero COVID policy has attracted a lot of criticism and complaints because the the price is very, very high in terms of our convenience of life, in terms of freedom of daily life, and in terms of the economy. I think in prevention and control measures and policies, China is very cautious. We do not want to be the trailblazer. That is to say, we, we will stick to our, just as you have mentioned, the dynamic zero policy, because just as Dr. Ding has said, there, there are still possibility of future 
mutation and the new virus may happening and the, the past infection may not stop you from getting infected from the new variants again. So I think in China, on the one hand, we still have our vaccination process, and we are also waiting for new form of vaccinations. That is what we are doing now. And on the other, on the, on the second hand, we still have strict measures and controls of the uh, ways to stop uh, infection, to maybe some kind of quarantines, maybe some kinds of just just as lockdown of uh, regions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think uh, we are not in a hurry. We are waiting to see what kind of variants we are going to have, and what uh, we are waiting for the new or just as Doctor Doctor Ding has said, better we can say vaccination mm. uh, or medicines or treatment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we are not in a hurry. We can wait, and the the zero dynamic policy, in my opinion, is to give China some kind of time and the room to wait for. Right. Um, finally, Doctor, what could have been the death toll in China if China has not pursued its zero COVID strategy, its dynamic zero COVID strategy? Any credible estimates to you? Well, the, the number would be, be even higher than in the US. I, I think there's a reason that there are reports that, that it's slow very low level sub infectious exposure build up the immunity. So in that respect, I think the American population in general has some degree of herd immunity. In China, we are well protected and people have not been exposed. So it would be very, very unwise to open up. Okay. It, it's, it's not going to be what we can afford. Okay. We're going to leave it there. Of course, the discussion is extremely important at this critical moment. Many thanks to my guests, Dr. Eric Ding, Dr. Wu Chong Yi, and Professor Hu Nai Jun, joining us from the United States and China. With that, we come to the end of this special edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Liu Xin in Beijing. On behalf of the whole team, thanks for watching. You've got The Point. <laughs>